Radio. You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. And good morning or good afternoon to all of you out there. You are here live with Dr. Jeff Werber with you for the next, oh, 30 minutes or so here on Pet Life Radio's only live show called Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. And we're here for you, and therefore we want to hear for you. Ha ha, play on words. 877-385-8882 is the way to get a hold of me. Once again, 877-385-8882. Pick up the phone, give a call. We can talk about anything. I have an agenda. I always have an agenda, but would love to hear from you. We can always change my agenda with things I want to talk about. We did get an email, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to answer that uh, in a little bit. But uh, first, I want to thank our sponsors, ProSense Pet Products and Kong, for being good to, to us and keep us here alive on the show. And of course, our wonderful producer, Mark Winter. So I want to talk about something, and I was not planning on doing this. As a matter of fact, if you were with us last week, we talked about having Dr. Heather Lenzer, a guest who is now with the American Animal Hospital Association. We've had her on before. She is great. Anyway, she is traveling. She's out of the country, actually. So she is going to be with us next week. Make sure to tune in next week. They'll get to talk to me and Heather. We're going to talk a little bit about Halloween. Yes, fun, but potentially dangerous. So uh, that's important. Now, what I really hadn't planned on talking about, because if you asked me about a week ago, even here in Southern California, where it's you know, typically pretty beautiful all year round, I would have said, I would have mentioned that the heat, the hot weather, the problems, the dangers have finally passed. Here we are, mid-October, and we're approaching, I mean, we're truly into fall, into autumn, uh, not too far from winter. And this, these are things that we would, if anything, I'd be starting to talk to you about cold weather hazards and tips to keep your pets safe during cold weather. Didn't think for a second that... Yesterday alone at my hospital, one I saw last night on emergency, the other one came in during the day, saw my associate, two cases of heat stroke. It's been over 100 degrees here in Los Angeles, and one dog is a very old Sheltie. The owner was just gone, had the dog in the backyard, in the shade, with water, I mean, all the good things to do, and she came home, the dog was flat out, and brought it in, ran it in, temperature 108 degrees. Now, you have to know that is the highest temp that I've ever seen on a dog. That is just absurdly high. And uh, fortunately, this dog was able to uh, survive. It's still at the hospital, however, on fluids. But the idea is that one needs to anticipate. And it is a real problem. Everybody has to know about it. The other dog, unfortunately, did not make it, was not so lucky. And this was a case where it was a, I mean, here, the owner did everything right. And it just shows you how, A, things can happen, bad things. It's like to say poop happens, and in a very sad way. So she lives in a nice area in Westwood that's near UCLA, and she lives in a condo complex. And the power, the power grid on the block, probably because of the heat, and too many people using, running their air conditioning, et cetera. So it was sort of too much power, over blew the circuits, and all the power went out. A few hours later, everything was back on. Everything was good. She had to leave for several hours yesterday. Her dog is a, was, I should say sadly, a nine-year-old, very large, 80-plus pound American bulldog that still had that, you know, American Bulldogs really run the gamut of what they look like. Some uh, look more like Bulldogs, some have more pit bull faces, but this one had more of the beautiful Bulldog face. And knowing that it was so hot outside, instead of leaving her outside in the yard or the balcony, she was going to leave inside in the air conditioning. Well, while she's gone, the power went out again. And she didn't realize it until very late at night. It was like 8.30. So she comes in, the dog is really panting, asks her neighbor, how long has the power been out? She said, oh, since about 2.30. So we're looking at about six hours here. So uh, even though the dog was inside, she said it must have been 85 degrees in the house. So she, since she had no air conditioning, she takes her two dogs and puts them in the car, puts the air, blows the air conditioning on full steam, and just starts driving with the air flowing right on the dog. And uh, she also 
has a, a horse at one of the local stables. So she was going to go figure she'll spend, go up to the ranch, to the stables, and that's air conditioned. There's a, a nice air conditioned uh, room there. So they'll just put the dog there. Anyway, while she's driving, she's kind of watching the dog in the rearview mirror. The dog is doing great, or so she thinks. And they get up there, and all of a sudden she says something like, Come on, guys, we're here. Let's go, let's go. She turns around, and he was like curled up as if he was sleeping. She goes off to him, nudges him, no response. She goes over, lifts up the gums, and they are gray. And in probably in, in the last five minutes or so, he just succumbed. So in a case like this, what makes it a little bit more difficult, a nine years old is old for American bull, but it's not ancient. The dog did have a heart problem, probably a cardiomyopathy, some sort of heart disease, was on medication. But just to, it just goes to show you that these things can happen even when you plan properly. So just be very careful. Hopefully, it hit me right in the spot because it was so sad. But hopefully, you won't have to deal with this again until maybe next spring, summer, unless you're living in an area in the south where it gets very muggy or here in uh, the LA Basin. It is just, today's another 100 degree uh, scorcher. So it is uh, very, very important to understand that heat stroke is real and all the warnings that we've given you over the past several shows when we talk about this, as far as hiking and exercise. And also, and this is a really, really important thing to remember, is that no two dogs are alike. Here she had two dogs, one's a little younger, not quite as big, in the exact same environment. And it gets one and not the other. Now, the reason in this one is because it did. the dog did have high blood pressure, was under the care of a, a specialist, and was stable. Had a, The blood pressure was down, but obviously had some sort of underlying cardiac defect, cardiac disease. So when you think of that, that a dog with these underlying problems will not, cannot deal with this type of stress the same way a perfectly healthy dog might be able to. A heavy dog may not be able to the same way a dog who isn't heavy. A brachycephalic, a pushed-in face dog, like the bulldog with a thick neck, may not be able to handle it as well as, say, a golden retriever. So you really have to treat your pets as individuals. I know last week we talked about the whole thing with vaccines, and we still have to talk about cats. That's another story. But the whole idea is that no two dogs are alike. Veterinary medicine is not a one-shoe-fits-all type of medicine type of practice. So just because one dog may need a vaccine, it doesn't mean another dog may need a vaccine. Disease prevalences in different areas. So all the things we discussed last week and this thing with the heat, it just really got me because I said to myself, I never in a million years would I've expected in you know mid-October, even here in LA, to get one heat stroke dog, let alone two. So that was, uh, it's very sad. And uh, so if, if you're still warm where you are, in fact, I was just uh, talking to my brother who's here visiting. He's originally obviously from here, but he's been living in New York for the last. And I asked him, I said, how's it been in New York? Is it starting to get cold yet? He goes, no, actually, it's it's still you know, very pleasant, still a little muggy. So who knows? I don't know. Maybe this global warming thing is real. I don't know. I, it is weird. I'm hoping that this year they're talking about the El Nino, which we get here in the West. I'm hoping it happens. That brings us more snow in the mountain, something I look very much forward to. But we have to understand that take precautions, plenty of water. If you are having issues with electricity, not only should you have air conditioning on, have a big blow fan, get a big floor fan and just shade. And preferably, if you don't have to keep your pets outside, if you are able to keep them, bring them in and let them chill with you inside, then do so when it gets really, really hot out there. So anyway, I also wanted to mention that on the vaccine issue, we're going to uh, do talk about cats. Now, next week with Dr. Lenzer here, I think we're going to discuss the Halloween issues. So if you have any questions about your cats, especially when it comes to immunizations, what should we, when should we, how often should we, do you give your uh, cats leukemia? Do you give your cats rabies vaccines? When would you and when would you not have to? How about FIP, the feline infectious peritonitis vaccine? Should you give that? Well, these are the things we're going to talk about. So once again, if you uh, want to talk, you can get a hold of me. Just give us a call at 877-385-8882. Once again, 877-385-8882. And we'll answer any questions you have. You can also join in the conversation. I'm playing here on the website right now. And just go into Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. You'll see a big box. And you can just go ahead and enter, type your message, whatever you want to say. So 
Speaking of messages, we did get an email this week from Debbie in Davenport, Iowa, of all places. I was on a cruise once and met a whole crew from Davenport. What a great bunch of guys. Anyway, she was having problems with her pet's ear and, I mean, chronic disease and a cocker spaniel, which is, I mean, that, uh, duh, that's a kind of a gimme. And she was being given some options as far as surgical treatment. And there are three that typically we like to talk about, three that we will recommend depending on the condition of the ear, its chronicity, uh, the dog's comfort or discomfort, et cetera. And the three main ones that you, your veterinarian, if you are in or have been in a situation like this with one of your dogs, is the lateral ear resection, probably one of the more common. The second is the vertical canal ablation. And finally, the last one is the total ear canal ablation. And that obviously is reserved, A, typically done by a board-certified surgeon. The, even the vertical canal ablation often is. I do that one myself. And the lateral ear resection, most general practitioner veterinarians can do that. So again, we're going to take a very, very brief break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the LER, the lateral ear resection, the vertical canal ablation versus the total canal ablation and give you all the details, the when, the what's, the why's, the how's, et cetera. So don't go away. We'll be right back here live on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. I'm home. My hair looks cute. Now what? Bringing home a puppy or new dog is exciting, and he's depending on you to keep him in good health. Dogs need special care to keep them healthy as they grow throughout their entire life. Caring for their health is critical in all stages. With ProSense, it's simple and convenient to give your dog the care it needs with effective and quality products that treat, prevent, and provide essential daily vitamins and minerals. ProSense products are veterinary formulated and recommended to ensure the very best for your pet. Try ProSense today. Your dog will thank you for it. Pets love life. Love them back with ProSense. Do you know that moment when your dirty dog's about to jump in your nice, clean car? You can avoid all the cleanup and mess with a 4K9 seat cover. 4K9 makes heavy-duty seat covers and cargo liners that will blend seamlessly with the interior of your vehicle. You can find us at 4K9s.com, that's the number 4, K-N-I-N-E-S.com, or on Amazon.com. 4K9 makes nothing but the best for your best friend. Nature at its best is nature at its simplest. At Red Barn, we've kept it simple for 20 years by concentrating on single-ingredient natural dog treats. Because Mother Nature's actually pretty good at this. Bones are just tasty bones. Meat treats are just nourishing meat. It's nature at its simplest. Look at the label. We want you to. Red Barn Natural Treats. Simply the best. Find it in your local pet specialty store. Try our slow-roasted natural meaty bones. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. <laughs> And you're back live here with Dr. Jeff Werber, for your host of Ask the Vet with Dr. Jeff here on Pet Life Radio. And before the break, we started talking about ear problems, um, pretty much chronic ear problems. And we'll see it in many, many breeds. Cocker Spaniels are one of the more notorious, but retrievers, dogs that love to get wet, first of all. And before we talk about some of the issues, let's talk about the problem with the dog anatomy. And that is that a dog's ear, when we have, let's talk about our ears. Our ears have a very short, what we call a short horizontal canal going from our ear on a straight shot into the eardrum, and that's it. So 
we typically, you know, again, be very careful if you're ever going to clean your ear with any, like a, a swab, a cotton swab. As we know, all the experts tell us not to do that. Just you can let some good shower water run in there and it'll clean the ear out pretty well because we don't want to rupture, tear the tympanum. That's the eardrum. It is that vibrating of the stimulus into the tympanum that starts the, the vibration, which then sends the signals through the nerves in the middle ear and the inner ear to our brain. And uh, that's kind of how the vibrations from sound are picked up and we are able to decipher, to determine what the sound, what is being said. Dogs and cats, interestingly, have a completely different anatomy in that they have a fairly long vertical canal that goes down and then makes a turn. It's not quite 90 degrees, but it's uh, about 120 degrees into a very short horizontal canal. And it is because of that anatomy and a ear flap, especially with the dogs that have floppy ears, that literally presents the problem, adds to a problem because you have now an environment where there is a dark, fairly deep, often moist environment, which is a perfect environment for infection, notably yeast infections. As a matter of fact, there seems to be a balance in the ear, the healthy ear, between the yeast and the bacteria. They're present often, but they kind of keep each other in check. When that balance is upset, it's usually going to favor the yeast. And that's why more infections that we see are, we call yeast infections, malassezia dermatitis, etc. I mean, otitis, as opposed to bacterial. But make no mistake, we can also see often bacterial infections. One tough one would be, for example, a pseudomonas infection, which is a very, very tough infection. Just so you know, I mean, it's, it's even hard for us sometimes. But basically, if the discharge is very dark, waxy, greasy, like black, it usually is yeast. If it's more like brownish, gray, greenish, more like a purulent or pus type discharge, then you're going to think bacterial. Now, obviously, you often will get both. Most of the otitis that I see are actually mixed. They have a little bit of both. So just understand that in order to come up with, a, with an accurate diagnosis, it's going to be important to do a, what's called a cytology and often a culture and sensitivity, which is your veterinarian will put a swab in the ear, collect a sample, and have it evaluated. It will grow it out on a medium. They will test the different antibiotics and go from there. Now, fortunately, most of the ear cases that we see are cleanable, are treatable. We send some medication home, and you're good to go. Many of uh, us have dogs, I, one of my Labradors, for example, that will have chronic problems. In other words, he'll be good. I'll treat him. He'll be good for weeks, even a couple of months, and then he'll get an ear infection again. I, you know, when you have these breeds that get it, you're a pro. You know what to do. You know how to do it. But what happens is when we have chronic issues, then we have to understand that there are some things that we can do. Now, the simplest, probably most common procedure done when we have these chronic conditions is called a lateral ear resection. In that, what the doctor does, is, first of all, that's where we see the cartilage of the ear canal starts getting a little harder, but the canal still is somewhat healthy, and we are trying to prevent a lot of this chronic disease, especially in, for example, cocker spaniels. So what we do is we just make a slice along the canal, and we just remove the cartilage and skin on just the outside part of the ear canal, the vertical canal. And that way, there's no deep canal anymore. When you lift up the ear, floppy ear, if it's a floppy ear dog, usually it is going to be, you will see just the inside semicircle of the vertical canal, the cartilage, the skin. It will look healthier. And then you'll see a little hole, which is a very short horizontal canal, the opening to the horizontal canal. These dogs do very well. It's a surgery that I would say a large percent of general practice veterinarians can do. And if they don't, they can certainly refer it to a specialist. The next one, one that I like even better, is called a vertical canal ablation. This is where we remove the entire vertical canal. It's a bit more of a challenging procedure. One needs to do a few of them to get comfortable. But basically what this one does, it eliminates the entire vertical canal. You sew skin, so if you lift up the flap, 
You have the side is all hair, like it is anyway, but there's no top ear anymore, no place to flush out or to introduce that swab or to do your ear cleaning or to put the drops in. But if you look about three inches or two and a half inches below the top of the, the flap, you're going to see a little hole. And that is just the only thing you're going to see. That is the opening to this short horizontal canal. So basically, what the vertical canal ablation does is it takes a canine ear, which has the vertical portion and the small horizontal portion, eliminates the vertical, and in essence, creates an ear, much like ours, where all it is is a little hole, a little opening, and it's, uh, I don't know, it's like, I don't know, half an inch. So that takes away most of the problem f- sources of these infections. There's no canal anymore. There's just a very short horizontal canal. These dogs do very well. But the trick to this one is you have to get it early enough for it to be effective. Why? Because as ears become very chronic, and this is what we see most often in Cocker Spaniels, the cartilage not only gets hard as a rock, it gets very, very, very thickened and enlarged. And it's very uncomfortable for a dog. Once that happens, the canal gets so narrow that there's no more airflow anymore, and there's no way that these infections can be treated. They cannot be prevented. And in cases like that, when you have that very chronic condition, you have that very thickened canal, you touch them on the side of the face, and it's like a bone. If you've ever medicated an ear and you squish the stuff around in the ear, you know what it's like. It's cartilage. It's like our trachea. But when you have this problem of chronic disease that the cartilage calcifies, it becomes more like bone and it becomes a huge, huge problem. In these cases, the only treatment that's going to be effective is a complete, what we call a total ear ablation, canal ablation, going all the way down to what's called the bulla osteotomy. That is the actual bone on the very inside of the ear leading to the brain. And that's where often we see really bad infection. And I don't know of any surgeons personally that, that would do it a complete ablation without also going into the bulla. You need to go in there. You need to drain it. And it's called a bulla osteotomy. And that becomes part of the canal ablation. Now, of course, when you go in to the ear, you remove the entire canal. You do the bulla osteotomy. You sew up everything. Now all you have is a cosmetic ear flap. There is no ear. So what does that do for your pet's hearing? Well, by definition, it's gone. So you have a dog who is comfortable as hell but can't hear. So, But it's very interesting. Now what is resting over that bulla, that portion of the brain that really gets all the last bits of vibration from the pre-healthy tympanum eardrum is gone. But what I see and have found, and it's fascinating, is that with the right sound or the right vibration, the skin vibrates, and these dogs can often hear something and respond. Sometimes they are t- completely deaf. Don't, don't ever get into a total ear canal ablation thinking that your dog will possibly hear again. No, don't think it. But it can happen. I've seen it happen, and it's amazing. Uh, it's hard to tell whether it's the vibrations, the heavy duty, like vibrations in the floor, what they're responding to, but they will respond. But let me, let me give you my classic story of Cocker Spaniel with an ear canal ablation. I used to take care of this Cocker Spaniel that was a real son of a you-know-what. This dog was so mean You couldn't even get near it. And of course, when the ears are bad, we have to clean the ears. And when you're cleaning the ears, you got to get up to the face and the head. And this dog wanted to chew you apart. It was the nastiest cocker spaniel. I mean, anyone who has cockers knows, don't kid yourselves. Cockers can be a little tough sometimes. But this one, I think he read the Chow Chow book or the, I mean, he was nasty. So anyway, because the ears were so bad and because we never really could care for them properly, they were only getting worse. We finally convinced mom to have the surgeon that I work with do a complete, a total ear canal ablation with osteotomy, bull osteotomy. Went to the procedure after the bulla. They put some drains in for a couple of days. All said and done, procedure over, dog heals, and guess what? This was the sweetest dog on the planet. This dog would lick your face. It just shows you how painful this poor dog was for so long. And that's why he was such a nasty, aggressive dog. 
Once the, the surgery was done, he became a pussycat. He would jump on your lap. He would lick. He would wag his little nub tail. It was the cutest thing ever. So don't underestimate your dog's ears. If they're having infections, make sure they're being cared for. Have your veterinarian do cultures, do cytology, find out the best way to treat it. If you continue to lose the battle, often these are secondary to allergy. One uh, allergy especially that I see very often with ear chronic ear infections is food allergy. So have your pet allergy tested or checked as well. Do uh, maybe a food elimination diet, but whatever it, it takes to get these ears under control because dogs with ear infections, especially chronic ear infections, don't kid yourself, are in pain. In fact, just so, you know, very briefly, one of the ways that I know my old black lab Grover has a, a relapse because when I have him and I'm pretty, you know, rough and I'm petting him with him and I'm saying, oh, come here, Grover, you're so cute. And I'm rubbing his head. And when I do and he lets out a little yelp, I right away, I look under, I lift his ear flap and sure enough, another infection. So uh, it is painful for these dogs. Anyway, thank you for joining me here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. Tune in next week, next week, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, noon back east. Uh, 10 and 11, whether you're Mountain Zone or Central. And we're going to have our special guest, Dr. Heather Lenzer. She's been with us before, general practitioner who did a lot of emergency work. And now she is working with the American Animal Hospital Association, AHA. And we will talk a little bit about AHA next week and about Halloween when we have Dr. Lenzer here with us. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next week. Have a great week, everybody. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.